with your invitation Bind us together, holy love Come with your peace, with your invitation Bind us together, holy love Would you stand with us, church family? Sing these words with us. They unite us. Jesus unites us. And I love that Encounter is cognizant of people needing even a more personal connection because I think the church does a great job with greeters, the welcome center, sending a card to people. But this is just going even one step further. Yeah. It shows that Encounter really cares about the people that attend here and want them to feel loved and that they belong. We landed here and you know, automatically loved it. We can share that excitement and it's true. It's not uh, anything fake. So we can tell them what we've learned, what we liked, give them information. And I had the same thought. We would check down a couple different churches before we land here and it just, it was hard to get always a, a real warm welcome and reach yep. out to like really mm -hmm. start to feel welcomed already and make extra connections. Well, what got me excited about the church too was um, we walked in and Tom Miller was right at the front door greeting us. The pastorship is fantastic here. The staff is top notch. Uh, the praise band, there's, there is no better. But other than that, we love the church. My vision for this group was confirmed by an email I received today by somebody who is joining the group who previously attended four growth groups, loved them, learned a lot, but she didn't get to know the people. This group I envision to connect people to one another so that when you go to church the following Sunday, these people walk in and they're like, oh, I know you from the connect group. Oh, I'm part of this community. 
I mean, I think there's so many different reasons. Now a lot of people work from home. So myself, I work from home. If I can just get out and talk to somebody, I can come home feeling giddy because it just feels like... <laughs> and he does. I, find, yeah, I do. It's I'm like, energy. It does. It gives you more energy because you finally got to converse with people outside of your home again. Well, and, and I really think that this is, is helpful. One of the first things that we did, we joined the Dinner for Eight. And that was a really good thing for us. We found some really quick friends that way. It's nice that we have two offerings and in between church services and uh, you guys are Wednesday evening. Sunday morning, Child Care with Kids Connection, which is easy and fun. And with our Wednesday night growth group, um, we'll have a sitter. We just don't want child care to stop you from joining a group. We're running from like six to seven, just enough before most young kids' bedtimes are like borderline. That should help fit most people that can make it for, say, a Wednesday evening instead. Our groups are um, year-round. It's just ongoing because people join the church every every week. And, and they can't. They don't have to commit. Yes. I think yes. sometimes that commitment of having to come mm -hmm. every single week is tough. Anybody, if you've been coming for five years, six, seven years, a welcome group. And yeah. You just want to have a good time. That's yes. Yeah. And I think something that Encounter Church does a really good job is loving people enough to meet them where they're at. Offering something just as small as, you know, a connect group, just come and meet us and, you know, let us love on you, love on your family, support you. I think that is such a beautiful sign of how much Jesus lives in Encounter. And we will have snacks. Yeah. yeah. If it's your first time here, we want to say welcome. Um, we're so glad that you chose to worship Jesus with us. Um, and if it is your first time, I encourage you on your way out. We have a welcome center, and that's just to the right outside of these back doors. Um, there's going to be some people there that would love to just say hi and get to know you, um, welcome you to our church. And um, there's also a connect card there that you can fill out and just provide any contact information you would like to, which allows us to stay in touch with you and keep you up to date on everything happening here, all the events, and all of that good stuff. Um, I also wanted to remind everybody that we started um, handing out infographics after service, and I think there's some around the seats also. It looks like this. Um, and so this morning, I just want to highlight two things on there. And first is the growth groups and the discipleship class. So um, I'm sure you saw the video. The growth groups, there's a bunch to choose from, and you can go on our website and um, read all about the different ones and sign up there. And then the discipleship class 101 that's happening, or wait, yeah, 101. I was making sure it wasn't 201, but it's 101, um, is tonight, and then part two is next Sunday. So if you plan on coming to that um, tonight and you need childcare, I would just let Kids Connection know. Um, and then if you plan on coming next week and need childcare, I would recommend emailing the office just so they can um, be prepared for how many kids might be coming. And then secondly, we have a quarterly Connect lunch coming up. And that's going to be on October 15th at 12 noon. Um, so after service um, in the youth room, we're going to just gather and eat lunch together. Um, and if you're new here, this is a great opportunity. Um, even if you're not new here and you just want to get connected and get to know the church family, the church staff more, this is the perfect opportunity. Um, so definitely mark your calendars for that. And like I said, you can grab an infographic, take that home um, so you don't have to memorize the dates. Um, before we enter a time of worship, if everyone would stand, we're going to say a word of prayer together. Dear Jesus, Thank you for this morning and the opportunity to gather together as a body of believers. Um, thank you for a place in which we can safely gather. Um, thank you for staff and volunteers who um, come early to prepare the service and prepare the worship. Thank you for their heart and their willingness to serve you and serve your people, God. I pray that you would just um, prepare our minds and our hearts to receive your word this morning. Um, 
humble us, convict us, and um, just thank you, God, for all of the blessings that we have. Everything we have is from you, and I pray that we would just use all that we have for you. Um, you are the one who gives and takes away, and you have every right to do so, God. Um, you are a provider, and we thank you, and we praise your name for that. Just bless our time together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Morning again, church family. So good to see you guys. You guys put on your whalers and waded in here, right? Um, just real quick, I wanted to let you guys know this, especially if you have young children or family. Encounter Worship will be playing a worship festival in E-Town this Saturday called Fall Afresh, and it's a family event. So if you have nothing to do, I really encourage you to do that because I think it's going to be a beautiful gathering of Christians from all these different churches to praise his name and worship his name. What a dilemma we find ourselves in as believers because if you really reflect on who God is, it'll render you speechless. Um, and yet if we don't praise him, the rocks will cry out. That also is in scripture, right? Um, his holiness, his, he is a sovereign God, a big God, and that he loves us is truly enough to drive you to your knees. We sing this song, the same song that many Christians before us have sung. Lift your voice and think and ponder upon his holiness. Sing that 
moments. Come on, I bow. This morning we had the opportunity to come together and be obedient to engage communion. And I, I've just been thinking all this morning about what a privilege that is. It's such a privilege to have our posture realigned, adjusted. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm thinking about this song and, and the question of, is he worthy? And we all know the answer to that. Yeah, he is, he is worthy. But we have this, this, this opportunity to get realigned in this new posture where we get to throw up our hands and, and surrender together to acknowledge that we live for someone who died for us. We have this opportunity to have our, our hands out together in generosity. What a posture that is. Together we are able to engage in mission that come, people can come to know him like you and I know him. What a privilege it is for us, for our lives to become Christ's broken bread. What a privilege it is that our, our love can be his outpoured wine that a lost world can find 
him. So as we continue in this special way of surrender, as you sing that question, may the answer of your soul and your spirit and all that you are be that he is worthy.
celebrate that with me, believers. That's the reason that we're alive. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, be with Ted this morning. This is what we know of our faith, that you ask us to die, but in that death is freedom and new life that only you can give. And we ask for the appetite and the knowledge through the Holy Spirit to receive that, to really receive that. That's what we want. That's why we come here. It's the only thing that really matters. It's the only thing that's eternal. Be with his words. Tether them to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Wonderful worship, church. Amidst the hurried haste I hear her Cuts through the clamor and the crowd She's standing in the streets She's wisdom She calls out truth She cries aloud in My name is Ted. I am one of the pastors here on staff at Encounter Church, and welcome to week three, the final week of our series, Wisdom for the Ages. How we can walk with wisdom, how scripture gives us wisdom to walk in this confusing world that we live in. And to start off with this morning, I want to just offer some encouragement. There is a beautiful, beautiful promise from Jesus, and I believe that Eugene Peterson captures it so well in his translation, The Message. Just listen to the words of Jesus here in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. Close your eyes if you want. This is just beautiful. Jesus says this, are you tired? Are you worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I will show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace and I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Just keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Boy, I need that promise in my life so often to come to him. And for this morning, what we're going to do, the way that we're going to wrap up this series is I thought that it would be a good idea in regards to talking with wisdom and walking with wisdom is how do we keep our souls hydrated? So that's what we're going to talk about. That's what we're going to talk about this, this morning. And to begin with, what I would like to offer is just a scientific, scientific fact. Our bodies are made up of primarily water. The stats I've read say between 55 and 70% of us is water. Therefore, it's accurate to say that hydration is critical to survival. Because the amount of water in our body, if it drops too low, our bodies start to have responses to that. Maybe a dry mouth, dry lips. Maybe you start to get a headache or dizzy. And even in some extreme situations, your heart rate increases or you can get confused or disoriented or you can even pass out. I actually have a romantic story about dehydration that I want to tell you. Yeah. Yeah. You probably don't get to hear many of those. But just over four years ago, uh, my wife and I traveled to Mexico. Uh, one of her uh, best childhood friends was getting married, and they had a destination wedding in Mexico, and Heather was in the wedding. And so off we went to Mexico, and our little girl Taylor was only five months old at that point, and so she came with us. And finally, the day of the wedding arrived, and it was a beautiful day. It was a crystal clear blue sky. There was no wind. We were on the beach just a couple feet from the Mexican water 
but it was hot. It was so hot, and there was no cloud cover that day. Now, Heather has been in multiple weddings before, and so she knows what to do to prepare for weddings. It's important to stay hydrated. We knew this. She knows how to stand and how not to lock your knees so that you have good blood flow while you're standing up there. However, even with all of that knowledge, being a nursing mom who was just a few months postpartum, standing in heels on the beach, In the direct Mexican sunlight, as the pastor spoke on and on and on, just became too much. You see, this is what happened. Uh, Because Taylor was so young, I was on baby duty, and so I was holding Taylor, but she was getting hot. And so we quietly left and walked to the back, kind of where the boardwalk started. So we could see and we could hear, but we weren't going to be distracting because she was getting a little fussy. And I'll tell you, the pastor, he just kept going. And I can say this about him because he and I are good friends. But you know you've been going on too long, and this actually happened halfway through through his message, one of the groomsmen just flat out passed out, just directly onto the person in front of him. You would think that would be an indication that you need to wrap things up, but no, he still had about 20 minutes. (laughs) And he just kept going. So we were, I was standing in the back and finally this pastor wrapped up and uh, the, 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 he, he announced the married couple. They walked out. Everyone was clapping and then the bridesmaids and the groomsmen started following and I was watching Heather as she was walking down and there was nothing concerning at first but then they turned left and they started walking towards me and Taylor and I saw her kind of point at me and then she stumbled And I was like, oh no, I know immediately what was going on. So I'm still holding Taylor, but I'm a ways away. So I start sprinting the best I can through the sand in my dress shoes, holding my little girl. And I get to them, and I literally just put Taylor in the groomsman's arms. Like, I don't know this guy at all, but I was like, you're on baby duty now. As Heather literally collapses into my arms. And then this is the romantic part of the story. I whisk her off her feet in Mexico on the beach right after a wedding, and I take her off to this little thatched hut. And then, of course, I get her some water. But I knew what was going on, and the entire wedding party got to see this. And so there was a lot of talk about it after. Now, this is, that's my romantic story about dehydration. But <laughs> thank you, thank you. Now, the reason that I tell you this, there is a point other than it just being a a fun story. Most of us, if not all of us, know the, the, the signs and symptoms of physical dehydration. You see, we know what to look for and we know how to fix it. But here's my question and here's what we want to talk about the rest of our time here this morning. Are we as equally capable of recognizing spiritual dehydration? When we have neglected the Holy Spirit and we have not allowed him to give us his strength in our lives and we have depended on our own very minimal strength, do we know the symptoms to look out for and what to do about them? You see, the reality is is I think this looks slightly different for each and every one of us, and it might be very subtle at first. Perhaps our relationships begin to suffer. Maybe we just feel more agitated. We have a shorter fuse. Things that wouldn't bother us begin to bother us. We have this desire to isolate ourselves from other people. Maybe we're having trouble sleeping or concentrating or making decisions. A heightened sense of anxiety, and we may not even know where it's stemming from. We're just feeling anxious all the time and irritable, inability to turn our thoughts off. For some people, and I'm going to be honest, this is the one that I have struggled with for a long time. When we carry stress for so long, it can actually make us physically sick. Friends, as we wrap up our Wisdom for the Ages series today, the goal for this morning is really twofold, very simple goals. My hope and prayer is that we can, that this morning can serve as a practical encouragement and reminder to listen to the words of Jesus and to come to the well. Jesus says, drink deeply from the water of life, the water that I will give you. 
And if you find yourself, this is the second point, if you find yourself in that spot of spiritual dehydration this morning, hopefully this time together will serve both as encouragement to you, but also serve some practical advice for rehydrating your soul. So, how do we stay spiritually hydrated? If you brought your Bibles with you, please grab them, pull them out, pull them from under your seats, turn on your phones. We're going to be in the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel chapter 12. We will have the words on the screen as well, so please feel free to follow up on the words as well. Now here is the, the back story. This is a story about a king who seemingly had it all, but he fell so hard and so fast and so publicly, we have to ask the question, what in the world happened and how did he get out of it? So here it is. King David had everything. Everything was going for him. He had power. He had fame, f influence, riches. He had an army. The people loved him. He was known amongst the other nations. And he was known as a man after God's own heart. But maybe he got too comfortable. Or Maybe the pressures of being king were, became too much for him and he lost focus on the Lord. We don't really know. Scripture doesn't explicitly tell us how he got to this place, but what Scripture does tell us is that everything changed in 2 Samuel 11. We're not going to read chapter 11. I'm, gonna just, I'm just going to quickly explain it. You know, David decided not to go out with his army to war. Now, was he wrong to do that? Possibly. I've heard good arguments both ways. Again, Scripture doesn't explicitly tell us. But there's no ambiguity about what happens next. You see, David finds himself one day walking around on the roof of his palace, which is a super common thing to do back then. It's cool. There's a breeze up there. But while he's up there, he sees a beautiful woman, and she's bathing. And, she, and, he, and David asks one of his servants, who is that woman? And, and the response is, that's Bathsheba. That is the wife of one of your best and finest soldiers. But David ignores that piece of information, and he uses his authority as king to invite her to his chambers. And he sleeps with her. Soon after, he finds out that she's pregnant, and he attempts to cover this up by inviting his, one of his best soldiers, Uriah, in from the war, and he encourages her, him to go home to try to cover up what he had done. But he refuses, and because David's attempt to cover this up doesn't work, he sends word back to Joab, his commander, and says, hey, in the next battle, make sure that, that Uriah is in the fiercest part of the battle and that he is killed in that battle, which is, of course, exactly what happens. And at the end of chapter 11, there are some extremely foreboding words. It says this, but the Lord was displeased with what David had done. Then chapter 12 begins with the prophet Nathan. Nathan comes and he tells David this story about an extremely rich man who had multiple flocks, herds, and lambs, and he had a guest coming to stay with him. But rather than taking one of the multiple lambs he had, he went and stole his neighbor's one and only lamb, and he butchered it and served it to his guest for a meal. And this is where we're going to pick up our reading here. So if you're with me, just read along in your Bibles. 2 Samuel chapter 12, starting in verse 5. And David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole for having no pity. And then Nathan said to David, David, you are that man. The Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites, and you have stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. And this is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it in secret, but I will make this happen to you openly in the sight of all Israel. And then David confessed 
to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you and you won't die for this sin. Nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord by doing this, your child will die. And after Nathan returned to his home, the Lord sent a deadly, Ill deadly illness to the child of David and Uriah's wife. And David begged God to spare the child. He went without food and lay all night on the bare ground. And the elders of the household pleaded with him to get up and to eat with them. But David refused. Then on the seventh day, the child died. And David's advisors were afraid to tell him. He wouldn't listen to reason while the child was ill, they said. What drastic thing will he do when we tell him that the child is dead? And when David saw them whispering, he realized what had happened. Is the child dead? He asked. Yes, he's dead. And then David got up from the ground. He washed himself. He put on lotions. He changed his clothes. And he went to the tabernacle and worshiped the Lord. And after that, he returned to the palace and was served food and ate. Friends, this passage is full of takeaways. We could talk about many, many different things, but that is all the further we're going to go in our passage today because now we need to ask our most important question. And y'all know this question. It was the same question Pastor Lon Solomon used to ask me every single week. And the only people in here that don't know this question are if you're new. And if you're new, it's so good to have you here. You're going to find out in just a minute what this question is. But for everyone else, please, on the count of three, shout this out loud with me. Here we go. One, two, three. So what? Yeah. Yeah, you say, Ted, so what? That is an interesting passage, to say the least. But what does this have to do with spiritual dehydration? And what can we learn from how David handled it? Friends, here's something that I've thought about for a long time. I can't say for sure what led to David's downfall. I kind of alluded to two possibilities. The scripture doesn't tell us. But that's not what I want to focus on this morning. Instead, what I want to focus on this morning is after David had done all of these things and when he was in that dark and dry and arid place spiritually, how did he get out? And I believe that we received four insights from this passage that we can apply to our lives and the importance of spiritual rehydration and being aware of the Holy Spirit working within us so that we don't fall like David did. So here's the first one. If you'd like to write things down, here's the first thing for you to write down. Number one, King David needed and received godly counsel. Friends, we need each other. You see, humans are created for relationship. The church was established by God, and it was established with the desire to be unified, to, 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 to be here for one another. But here's the thing. When we as humans get into a tough spot, our natural human inclination is to isolate ourselves from those we need to be around the, mush, we, the most. We want to push people away. But here's something that's really interesting. That is the exact opposite of what we need to do. And listen, we're going to talk about the importance of solitude and silence and prayer in just a minute. But isolation is not the same thing as solitude and silence. Listen, isolation is more like the negative side effect when we have neglected the spiritual refreshment of solitude and silence. And we're going to get into that in just a moment. But the first thing that we can learn about David's story is that speaking with people who will provide both godly insight and counsel is so important. We must not try to do this life on our own. You see, in this situation, David desperately needed Nathan, but he didn't know that he needed him. You see, a question I've often asked is, what if Nathan had been disobedient and he hadn't come and confronted David? I'm sure that was a nerve-wracking thing for him to have to do, but what if he hadn't done it? Would have David repented? You know, what if he thought that he had gotten away with the things that he had done? Would have he been forgiven? Would he be allowed to live? The, the, the law is very clear on what the consequences of adultery were. Because it was repentance that God was after. But praise God for 
Nathan? We don't know the answer to those questions, but praise God for Nathan and David's life. You see, biblical wisdom says that doing this life alone is not the way. That is not strength. That is foolishness. And this is where the church comes in. So you may not have a Nathan in your life right now, but we can find that type of support and counsel in the church. Yes, friends, it takes work, it takes humility, it takes effort, it takes time, but boy, do we need it because the Lord uses others to refresh our souls. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10 says it this way. It says, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. So that's the first takeaway. Godly friends and counsel are so important to spiritual hydration. They're so important for our souls. Number two, the next thing that we see David do, the next thing that we should remember in our lives is that King David needed to confess his sins. Here is an awesome an extremely powerful truth. God wants to forgive our sins. This past week, I heard a very brief devotional from pastor and author uh, Craig Groeschel. I enjoy listening to Pastor Craig. He has a lot of wonderful insights, but he was just giving a brief devotional about Matthew 5, chapter 4, the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You see, I had always read that passage thinking, blessed are those who have experienced tragedy in their life, for they will experience comfort in the kingdom of God. Maybe you've read that passage like that before, and I think that's true, but I don't think it's the complete truth. And what Pastor Craig talked about is it also would include this concept. Blessed are those who are in mourning because of their sin. And what the consequences of that sin have been. Friends, that was such a powerful insight for me because it is perfectly in alignment with what we see right here with David who fell so far short of God's glorious standards. Nobody would look at this passage and say, well, that was trivial. No, no, you can't get much worse than what David did here. But I just want to, to, to remind you God forgave David, and the same offer is true for each and every one of us. He wants to wrap his arms of forgiveness around us. He wants to, to, to forgive us and to love us and to show him that he is there for us. The, listen to the words of David. After confronted by Nathan, we read it in Psalm 32. It says this, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Isn't that a vivid image of what we're talking about this morning? Finally, I confessed all my sins to you, and you stopped and I stopped trying to hide my guilt. And I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. You see, friends, not every situation where we are feeling spiritually dehydrated is caused by some glaring, life-altering sin. Certainly some are, and those need to be dealt with appropriately with restitution and confession. But even if you're just feeling down and out, you may not even know why. I think it's still appropriate for us to come before the Lord and just say, Father, search my heart. Test my motives. See if there is anything offensive in me that I am not aware of, that I am blind to. Please lead me in your paths. Forgive me. Fill me. It is not my intent. It is never my intent to sin against you. Lord, please direct me. You see, confession is releasing for the soul. And some of you might need to just hear me say this this morning. Whatever you've done, whatever has happened in your past, Jesus is saying, come to me. I want to forgive you. I will forgive you. His death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave show the depths of his desire for you to receive the forgiveness he offers. You don't need to carry that weight anymore. He says, put it down. Give it to me. And then come to me and I will comfort you. Friends, that is number two. 
He says, confess your sins and you will be comforted. Number three, King David practiced solitude, silence, and prayer. Now, admittedly, he did it in a kind of strange way. Clearly, David is experiencing grief here, and grief can make people do extreme things. I am not saying that going out and lying on the ground all night is the way to uh, experience this sort of, this template for this. But that being said, the practice of solitude, silence, and prayer are critical for spiritual rehydration. Friends, please hear me say this. It is critical to slow down, to stop, to heal, to think and pray, to fast, to recover, to spend time with the Lord and simply allow him to chip away at the other voices that are clamoring to crowd his voice out. You see, Jesus was the perfect example of this. Look at all the times Jesus did this. There are six times the New Testament specifically mentioned that he went away by himself and why he did it. He did it before a major undertaking. Matthew 4 records Jesus going off to the wilderness for 40 days to pray and fast and be alone before he began his ministry. Luke twenty two forty one 41 records Jesus going to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray before a time of great stress and hardship. Jesus also did this to recharge after a season of hard work. This is a fascinating verse. Listen to this. Mark 6, 30-31. It says the, the apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour. Jesus had sent them out. They came back in. And he told them all that they had done and taught. And Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. Number four. Jesus practiced this when he needed to work and process through grief. When his cousin John the Baptist was killed, Matthew 14, 12 to 13 says this. Later, John's apostles or disciples came for his body and buried it. And then they went and told Jesus what happened. And as soon as Jesus heard the news, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. Number five, Jesus went away to specifically spend time in prayer. Mark 1, 35 says, before daybreak, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Number six, before making a big decision, Jesus went and prayed. Luke 6, 12 to 13, in those days, Jesus went out to the mountain to pray. And all night long, he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12, whom he named apostles. You see, Philippians 4, 6 through 7 encourage us. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done and then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and mind as long as you live in Christ Jesus. You know, listen, just to tie this back into the story that I told about Heather, when she was feeling physically dehydrated, she needed what she needed to do, what she had to do in that moment was to get away from everyone. She had to sit down. She had to drink some water. Only after that was she able to re-engage, and the same thing is needed for us spiritually. Friends, do not neglect the need to get alone and just be with God. Isolation is not the same thing as solitude and silence and prayer. And if you're feeling the effects of spiritual hydration, I encourage you to practice this. It doesn't have to be hours on end. Listen. Just regularly work some time into your day. And I know maybe the best you can do is five minutes locked in your bathroom because you have young kids and that's all the time you can get. My wife made me promise that I would add here, make sure your kids are safe first. <laughs> but time spent with the Lord in solitude, silence, and prayer is an act of worship. And friends, it is like water for a parched soul. And this is the fourth and final thing David did. I love what he does here at the end. Maybe you caught it, but scripture says that he got up from the ground. He washed himself. He put on lotions. He changed his clothes, and then he went to the tabernacle, and he worshiped the Lord. You see, I'm not sure exactly how long David was fasting. Scripture's a little confusing on this. Eh, maybe it was just a night or maybe it was a week. I, I don't really know. But the point is, I'm confident that David was hungry. But before he ate anything, he went to the tabernacle to worship. 
a really important key that I think we can take away from that is his sin didn't drive him from God. It drew him to God's presence in the tabernacle. David knew exactly where he needed to be and what he needed to do to refresh his soul. Friends, worship takes many forms, but at its core, it's simply coming before the Lord and worshiping him for who he is, for what he has done to sing out to the Lord, to raise our hands in surrender to him, to kneel before his presence. Whatever we do, do it for the Lord. Scripture says that is your spiritual act of worship. And Psalms 42, one through two, encapsulates this so well. It says, as the deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. So let's come to the well. If you're feeling that right now, maybe your week was hard, maybe you came in with burdens and you don't even know why, come to the well. Jesus says, I will give you spiritual water and I will refresh your soul. And friends, this is what we're going to do right now. This is our challenge. Hey, we are just going to spend these next few moments in worship to the Lord. Allow him to refresh your soul during this time for he is a good and loving father. And we're going to enter into a time of communion here. you feel uh, uncomfortable or unable to come forward, just raise your hand and one of the ushers will bring you a little pre-packaged communion cup so you're welcome to stay in your seat. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, we read this. It says, The Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took the bread and when he gave thanks for it, he broke it and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's enter into prayer. Let's enter into worship. Take this time to just sit before the Lord when you're not up walking around. And when you're ready, take the communion cup and the bread. Father God, Thank you so much for this opportunity to receive communion together, that we might be unified, a support for one another, an encouragement for our souls. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and the price he paid for us, for our forgiveness, so that we might be made whole in you. We receive this communion. We love you, Lord. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Stadium seating, please come forward. Consider what you have made. The mighty oceans, the fiery stars, the fields and forests give you praise. My Lord, my God.
stand with us, church family? Sing these words with us. They unite us. Jesus unites us. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. As always, it's been a joy to worship with you. Um, before we head out today, I just wanna remind everyone of a few things. And the first is the ways to give, which will be on the screen behind me. We also have the drop boxes on the way out. And um, we just wanna say thank you for your generosity. Um, it all goes back to the Lord. Um, it is his, everything we have is his. And so when you give, to the ministries here, you are giving to the Lord and it all goes to serve him and his people. So thank you for your generosity in that. <clears throat> and lastly, is our prayer banner, which is over here to the right. You came in this morning with a heavy heart and you would like someone to pray over you and with you, definitely stop by there. We have a prayer team and they would love to pray with you. Um, so yeah, definitely check that out. Don't be afraid. They truly would love to pray for you. Um, it has been a joy, and we hope to see you back here again next week.